Good news everyone! Two weeks after it is due to arrive, my engine has just been delivered to the unit. Well, nearly. The delivery man is there with a pallet and a very big smile on his face because he's now having to wait for us to drive from our house to the unit to open it up and drop it in. But I'm delighted. Dad's delighted. Adrian's probably going to be delighted when he finds out. Delivery man can just kind of sit for a little bit. He'll be fine. He'll get over it. Um, but yeah, we're going to go get it off the pallet, get it unboxed, and I'll hopefully start stripping it apart real soon. Good news everyone, I'm not dead and I've also not been fired from the show. I'm still here, unfortunately I'm quarantined down in South Wales with my parents. Uh, the good news is I'm quarantined in South Wales with my SD1 and I'm quarantined, ooh, as, I'm quarantined as of 20 minutes ago, a new engine for my SD1. Now the engine here is a bit of a special one, there's not many of them around and it was only ever installed into this specific car, the, the PE166 from British Leyland never went in any other vehicles besides the Rover SD1. Um, what I need to do is tear this engine down, clean it up a little bit, and hopefully stab it into grumps in time for it going into the body shop in about two or three weeks. If I can't get that done in time, it will be in the body shop for three or four weeks, and I can hopefully tear the engine down in time to put it in after, because the engine that's in there now has a very, very leaky rear crank seal. So I'm gonna have to sort that at some point, and I figure the easiest way to do it is have the engine out, and I figure if I've got the engine out, I may as well put another engine in, so let's get cracking. So now that we've got all that stuff off the end of the engine, I'm going to try bolting into these two bolt holes at the top. They're only small, but they're the best I've got because that one is actually larger than the through holes on my stand. And I'm just gonna to go to that one on the bottom there, run a big old length of rod through with a nut behind it and one onto here. And what I'm basically hoping is that all of the little arms coming off the engine stand span wide enough that when we take the crankshaft out later, this seal unit, which um, want, kind of wants to pop off the end of the block here, but I think is held in place by this inner ring, which is held in place by this flange here that I can't work out how to remove. I think it may involve Oh, no, there's no Allen bolt down there. It looked like it might have been, but it isn't. Um, so yeah, it's going to remo involve removing this, and I'm hoping that once we've got the stand and everything on, we can pull the crank out, and this whole thing here will just come with it, rather than, like, catch on the arms or anything. So, uh, fingers crossed. Today we learn I'm really, really dumb. I had actually managed to miss these two bolts underneath that are still holding the crank seal piece on. Now, I still don't think it will come off because of this flange, but we're going to pop them off anyway, see if this comes apart anyway, and just kind of try our luck a little. Right, good news and bad news. Uh, it turns out the bolts that I found underneath do in fact release the rear crank seal. Hey, look at this, all happy. The bad news is the big cracking noise I heard earlier that I thought was the seal giving out was this. So uh, the rear crank seal's toast and I need to buy a new one. So that's kind of a bummer. So once we've got this on the stand of the sump off and everything, undo these bolts and the whole thing should drop out and I don't need to worry about this flange right now. Happy days! So I'm going to put all the bolts in so I don't lose them, and then finally we can get this whole thing on the stand. What just shifted? And that is Phase zero, done. Let's get this out of the way. I'll give you a little tour of the PE166. Masterpiece of engineering that it is. Actually, I'm just gonna whiz the starter motor off real quick because it's kind of ugly and in the way. And then I'll give you a tour of the PE166. So we'll see you in a minute. So here we are, the engine is fully bolted up to the stand, nice and solid, there's no play here at all. I'm quite happy to start working on this, although it's all mostly held up by M8 screws, it seems to be just fine. So we're going to start pulling this apart, I'm going to take the intake side, Sam's going to take the exhaust side, and we're going to go piece by piece. But before we get into it, I'm just going to run you through what this engine is, 
Um, it is a 2.6 litre straight six. It's called the PE166 from British Leyland. It only ever went into the SD1, so there's not a whole lot of them around. And it's actually fairly interesting in a few ways that we'll hopefully see later in the teardown. The general gas flow through it is fairly normal. Cross flow, intake one side, exhaust the other. Um, it's a fairly normal two valve per cylinder design, intake and exhaust, as you may expect from any internal combustion engine. The weird one though, is it's an overhead cam engine that has one cam lobe per cylinder, not per valve, per cylinder. The same lobe actuates both the valves, one directly. I can't remember which intake or exhaust, but it actuates one intake of them directly. Is direct, I think. Oh yeah, because it's on the intake side, yes. so it'll be pressing the intake valve directly and the exhaust valve with a rocker, which is quite interesting. It's um, inherited from a Triumph engine, a little Triumph straight four that was kind of developed and developed and developed eventually into this. Interestingly though, it shares almost no parts with it. I think it's like a con rod or some of the dimensions of the con rod it has in common, but everything else is new. Um, so we're gonna start tearing this apart now. Uh, first to come off, I think is gonna be just the exhaust manifold there, which is a nice six into two into one uh, collector design and the intake manifold and carburetors. So I'm gonna get rid of these SUs sooner or later. It's gonna be going onto uh, full electronic management, probably uh, something like individual throttle bodies off of a E46 M3 or similar, because that makes it quite easy to run boost, regardless of whether I go turbo or supercharger, or even if I just wanna run a nasty, naturally aspirated engine, that kind of opens up a lot of options to me that I don't really have with these carburetors. It doesn't help with these carbs that the manifolds on them it seems fairly nice at a very quick glance, but actually the gas flow through them isn't very good. The manifolds are a two into six design, so it's split like you've got two airways into the carbs. Cylinders two, three, four, and five, the middle four get quite nice airflow. So you've got the carburetor, then the airflow kind of splits naturally in two out of there. But cylinders one and six at the very front and back of the engine, the air runners are a lot longer and a lot more aggressively slanted out to reach. So I would wager they don't get either such good airflow or such good fuel mixture, something will be iffy with combustion in those. And I guarantee you, Rover will not have accounted for that when they were designing the camshafts for these. So hopefully going to individual throttle bodies, on top of giving me full engine management and fuel and spark control and all that good stuff, should actually just give us a natural breathing improvement and give us much more even combustion through it. Um, but it doesn't really matter right now because that's all quite a long way off because that's hundreds and hundreds of pounds of parts. Show people what the black death is. Is there none in there? Oh, there's loads in here. So, some of you may have heard of the black death in it's engines. Fine. Have a look at this. That is horrendous. I mean, it's silky. Yeah, it's smooth, but, but it sure it's not flowing round, is it? Look at that. Hold out, isn't it? Oh, God. <laughs> that is awful. Yeah, we don't want that. Yeah. Now with the cylinder head off, we can see the benefits of that weird valve train arrangement that we've got going on. With one camshaft, we can keep a nice 40 degree included angle between the intake and exhaust valve there. And it means that both ports into the head, into the chamber, out of the chamber, out of the head, have a really nice clear gas flow path, which should in theory, help this engine breathe pretty well. Unfortunately, it's held back by the camshaft being super tame. So I'm hoping to grab a, beat, a beefier camshaft in future, but that's just one of the many, many, many things I've got planned for this engine. And of course, also we've got all this horrible, horrible coking on here that I wanna deal with. These chambers are disgusting. So definitely need to clean up. Hopefully, hopefully once we've got a new cam in there and some better breathing on the intake and output, it should, uh, should make some pretty good power. Now down in the guts of the engine, we've got the pistons and rods out and we can see the big ends here, which not super huge, they're a decent size. We've got some pretty beefy journals here. The interesting thing with the journals though, is you'll probably notice there's only four of them. And this is a big contributor to how this engine got fairly good fuel economy. Any of you have watched our previous episode where we did a quick fuel economy test after I did some ignition tweaks, uh, will remember that it actually made pretty good mileage for a car of its age and its size. This is a 2.6 litre straight six and it routinely scores um, like mid-ish 30s miles per gallon on a, on a motorway cruise, which is pretty great for, for anything of this size. The trade-off is it means the crank is a fair bit weaker um, against the vibrations between the two cylinders because there's so much more gap 
between each of the journals, there's a lot more room for the crank to bend as each piston like hammers away at it under combustion pressure. And the way Rover dealt with this is uh, is twofold. One, they made it ridiculously beefy. This is an absolute monster of a crankshaft just in terms of the amount of metal that's in it and the counterweighting and everything that's in it. But they also made it out of EN16 forged steel, which isn't, it's not like miracle metal, but it is a pretty high quality forging. So this is a really, really strong crankshaft. There's a, and this is one of the other main things that basically had people at the time, builders at the time, and uh, a few armchair experts on the internet today, thinking this engine was destined for a lot more than 135 horsepower. So there you have it. Chris lives and he's been working on the SD1 while he's in Wales. And now we have two engines to play with on that car, which is a good job because there's some pretty big plans for that. Some flavor of boost and eventually it'll all go back into a newly rebuilt body, which is going to look awesome. And it's going to protect it for the next, hopefully, 30, 40 years again. So it shouldn't rust into the ground. Thanks very much for watching. I'm glad you stuck around this long if you've been waiting for SD1 content. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy some of our merch at shop.pedalbox.show. And if you'd like to support the show directly, check out patreon.com slash pedalboxshow, where you can help us in our builds on the channel. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>